Um, what I'm going to talk about, it relates to all mobile games and even Facebook games, but it's mainly focused on my experience in iOS. And what I want to basically do in this talk is depress the heck out of everyone. No, <laughs> I want to make it clear that a lot of times we'll hear talks and it's always someone who is with a company that's either selling app installs or they're selling analytics and stuff. So I'm actually on the other side of the fence. I, um, I'm the chief creative officer for a company that publishes and develops apps and we, always, we have not always had a smooth time of it and to be honest, like uh, to be fair, we've made some mistakes, we'll talk about those and uh, we're doing a good job of dealing with that. So um, just remember this as a start, that 50% of all the revenue for apps on the iPhone go to about 0.1% of the apps. So one out, of, one out of every thousand apps is probably what's making most of the revenue here. So since I've been in the video game industry for a long time, I must tell a joke. <laughs> So, this producer from Activision goes to a comic book show in the late 1980s, and he negotiates worldwide video game rights to a new comic book for $25,000, which is about the par for, the, for that time. And at the time, Activision would do marketing groups with kids, free pizza, and the result of that marketing group, that focus group, was that teenage boys show little interest in anthropomorphic turtles. So Activision <laughs> turned down the rights to uh, all of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the late 80s. Which the point of this being is that everyone knows everything. You hear a lot of stuff, and, and in this case, since we're so small here, feel free to tell me I'm full of it and interrupt or whatever, <laughs> ask questions, because I'm not really formal about this. I have no game industry. So basically, let's talk about the game industry in terms of what happened in the game industry. So the back, of, the first picture is a back of a game I worked on in 1982. And that's the era when we started doing box games. There actually was a prior era where we actually shipped games in plastic bags, if you can believe it. And that was pretty straightforward. You, you, you either were working with a company that was a publisher, or you were a developer for that company. They built the game, they got it to distributors, distributors put it in the stores, it sold or it didn't sold. There wasn't a lot of titles on the shelf. Then we get to the uh, Nintendo era, which is actually, everyone wonders why Nintendo did the things they did. Nintendo did what they did because there was a video game crash and, and it was because of crappy products. So Nintendo vetted everything. And so what we used to go on there, like in this case, this is Activision's Ultimate Air Combat for the NES. We would go to Japan, show the title or show the prototype of the title and get allocation cartridges. And pretty much it was, to be honest, a license to print money because once you had the allocation, you shipped it to Toys R Us and you sold your cartridges. It was kind of hard to mess up. It was basically ex execution and relationship. Then we have the first era of mobile phone games, which I um, actually showed you a game I also I was involved with. And that was an era where the carriers controlled everything. And people forget about this. There used to be something called the deck. And you would get approved by the carrier, they'd put your title on the, the deck for two weeks, and if it didn't sell, it would go off the deck. And it was very expensive. I used to have a slide of the uh, Goku saying over 9000 for how much it cost to just get approved by Verizon. It was over $9,000. And then finally, we have the iOS era which is good and bad. Um, I've been on iOS apps for seven years. I know that sounds preposterous, but we actually did a web app the week, the week the iPhone shipped, and we did web apps for a year. Then the app store for the early years was basically like the Oklahoma land rush if you got there early. I know a guy who had a so-so solitaire game and is making money from it still today. Probably still the number one solitaire app because he was out there first. And then freemium started taking over, which is the apps that are free with in-app purchases. And now I think what's happening is it's becoming a publisher game. I think you know, it's clear to me that publishers are starting to dominate. And a lot of independents, myself included, have decided that it's not such a terrible thing. And then I also think one of the good trends is we're starting to see premium games, games that are actually cost real money, that, like we used to charge back when I was doing apps for the TRS-80. You know, we used to charge $20 for a game, $15 for a game and maybe that will happen again, so we'll talk about that. So I missed the NES. There are only 785 titles for the entire NES catalog, period, for the entire lifetime of the app thing. Uh, app Store has no barrier. You, you can read the numbers, tremendous, insane. Um, so what happened here at the app Gold Rush? It's sort of akin to the regular Gold Rush, you know, and basically what happened in the regular Gold Rush was gold miners found, that were, you know, people found that there was gold in California, they all rushed in, uh, most people didn't make a cent. Uh, they just, you know, some people would make money and most people wouldn't. Um, and that's what happened with apps. Basically, um, 
people decided that this was a great business, it was exciting, it was a great way to be an independent, and they all jumped in, and most of them did not make money. The, the, the miners who were successful, you know, they, they, they got lucky or they were really worked hard at it. Angry Birds is Rovio's 53rd app, and um, there's a thing called survivorship bias. Has anyone ever heard of survivorship bias? Well, here's a story. Uh, in World War II, a bunch of mathematicians were hired by the army to figure out what hard things to do because they didn't really have good computers. And one of the problems the army had was deciding where to put armor in bombers. So the army was all set to put the armor where the most holes were. And the truth is, that's completely wrong because those planes survived to get back to base. Well, the mathematician says, no, you put the armor where you don't see the holes because those are the planes that aren't making it back. And what I mean by that is, there are lessons to learn from successful games, but that's a mistake. You probably could learn more from the games that fail than you can from the games that succeed. The successful games, you have something called survivor ship bias. Please find the article, it is amazing. There's a whole bunch of stories there. So who's making the money? Well, in the case of the original gold rush, one of the richest guys was a uh, shopkeeper, supplier. This guy named uh, Samuel Brennan. Uh, basically, he made a lot of money, he got rich, and of course, all the people who did the railroads and stuff became you know, the richest men in America. And in the case of the iPhone, it was the people really making the money are in mobile, are the ad networks, the MLA companies, tool companies, and some publishers, and of course, not this conference, but the conferences that you hear all the time, like App World or you know, Social Mobile, blah, 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 blah. I go to a lot of them because I like meeting people from the industry and doing deals, but there's a lot of people making money here, and it's not necessarily you. Um, so we're going to talk about some number stuff. Um, so you, just to explain this, these are just terms. Um, I call CPU cost per user, it's not that common of a term, but what it really means to me is how much I paid to get a really It is not the same thing as how much it costs to get it installed. Retention and churn, you know, retentions, people actually stay around for a while, churn is how many people you're losing, they're sort of like opposite sides of the same coin. The viral coefficient thing, um, I have seen so many spreadsheets where people say, well, for every person that plays this game, they're going to invite two friends, and they're going to invite two friends. Well, that almost never happens. Um, ARPU is revenue per daily user, we, you hear about that, and I'm just putting these terms up so when we talk about some numbers, it'll make sense. And here's what we're going to disclose. This is some um, deep, I'm proud of this, because what I did here is I basically went through all the ad units that we use, and I actually determined who's making money here. So I had turned out to be a pretty fair deal. And in, in this case, I had revenue from 16,000 impressions one day, and basically on one small app. And basically what I determined was that Apple was making a profit margin of 24%, which seems to be pretty reasonable. In other words, uh, if the Apples were charging developers 25 cents per click, they were paying me 17 cents per click to run the ad in my app. I figured that out. I mean, so that's fine, you know, and uh, we'll talk more about iAds as a tool for acquiring users. But let's take a look at a very popular thing called a video ad campaign. And here, I, I start out with what we pay to acquire users. And then I basically go to the very bottom and look at the view payment I get per view. Assuming a similar click rate, that's 187% profit. A company is basically doubling their money. So they're charging developers X to acquire users and paying out to the people who run the ads about half of that. So they're making a lot of money. And you gotta be very careful. People will be, you know, I actually have this saying and it annoys people. I say, you know what, if you wanna save some time, Take your venture capital checks and just make them out to the ad agencies. And that way you don't have to build a product and go for all that mess. Because a lot of products out there, I would say the vast majority that use paid acquisition, most of them never make money. The cost of acquisition are so out of tune with the lifetime value of your users, it's incredible. And paid apps are very hard to market, but there may be a reason to do them. So uh, marketing, let's talk about marketing, blah, blah, blah. No, we. This is stuff you should know. You really got to start from day one thinking about why people would want to play the app. I think studying the app store is a great exercise in humility and uh, learning. Um, I try to look at the charts every day and try to figure out why an app is selling. And I get surprised sometimes. And there are decisions that have to be made. And once again, I'm going to bring up the idea that uh, I am, by the way, I'm not publishing anyone else's titles. I'm actually in a situation of, I'm, well, I, I can't say it, I can't announce it, but I have, close some deals in regards to finding publishers for our titles, because I think that's important. And there's this thing I call the iPhone this, which I still believe makes a difference, and how you launch the app and all that.
So we'll talk about that a bit. So how do people find apps? Um, I think word of mouth is still number one. I really do. I think the apps that really succeed, succeed because people think enough of them to tell their friends. The top charts used to be the number one way. We'll get into that. Advertising number apps, blah, Apple features. I've had apps featured by Apple. Um, the folks before me, Appy, has had every app featured by Apple. That's a big, big deal. It's one of the reasons why they're profitable. They got Apple to feature the apps, which means they don't have to spend as much money. Social advice can matter, and as I said, word of mouth both front and back. Um, so the freemium and ad-based apps, really there's a calculation here, which is basically the revenue you get per day times how long the users stay around is basically how much money you make. It's not that complicated. Um, a positive K factor means that you do what people claim to be doing all the time, which is they bring in one user and get two. That almost never happens. Um, you know, it just doesn't. I mean, uh, I think the only example I know of recently was the original Draw Something, which got to a, a big number and then faded away when it was acquired. Um, it's very rare. But retention is the critical thing, and I'll talk about retention and how different it can be. Uh, if you can get an app that actually gets a reasonable a freemium app or an ad support app that gets a reasonable amount of money per user per day and they stay around long enough, you can actually afford to acquire users. Um, as I said, the cost per install for free apps ranges from a little over a buck to eight bucks. Uh, there are cheaper things, and we'll talk about those cheaper things and why it may not be such a good idea. Um, good retention. This is really good retention. I don't know if you can read the bottom numbers, but it goes out to day 112. And, um, I'll talk about this app in a little bit. This is, this was like, when I bring up the problems people have with apps, I'm going to bring up apps that actually sold well but had problems. This is an app that had an amazing retention. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, 30 some odd percent of the people around after 112 days is freaking amazing. Um, we'll talk about that. And then here's an example of really craptastic retention. Though it isn't really as dire as it looks, because after the first day, pretty much everyone but 15% of the people drop out. But from that point on, those people stay around. And that's what this chart shows. It shows how many people stay around. In this case, it goes out to day 126. And what that means with this app is, if you look at these two apps and you compare them, really what's going on here is that this app costs a lot of money to get a paid user, to, to, but they do stay around. This app costs a lot less to get a user, a paying user, or a playing user, and they, but they stay around for a long time anyway. So they're not really that different. It's just that we have to pay much higher costs because people are coming into this app, looking at it inside, the heck with that, but some people decide to stay. Um, this is the most important thing in terms of metrics. The cost per install is not the cost per user. You will get sold when you talk to these agencies, they start talking to you. I know this sounds annoying, but they just start talking and they'll say, look, we've got your cost per install down to $1.50. You're making more than $1.50 per user, aren't you? You can make more than that, and of course you can, but the problem is, for the people you bring in, most of them will not convert to data, daily players unless you're really lucky. I'm, I'm just sorry. Um, loyal users don't just run the app once. And this is why sometimes, contrary, I'm going to be very contrary here, sometimes a paid app is a good idea. And I will talk about an app that I wish I had done as paid, and I'll explain why when I get to it. It's interesting. This is the new, new, new thing, and uh, it's important. And what it is, is it's called cohort analysis, and what it says is, I hook up analytics in my code so that I can track users as a group. Like, think of like people who come off of an, air, an airplane flight. Like, they come off flight 35 from New York, and then I follow them and see what they do in Ottawa for the next two weeks. Well, in this case, they come off, let's say, an ad unit. They come off of an ad I'm running on Flurry, and I see what they do over the next couple days. Do they um, stay around? Do they not? And, and in this case, that they have all these people showed up and then over time they just didn't stay around. They just didn't stay around. That's an example of a bad situation. The darker temperature means less percentage stayed around. The reason why this is important is that if you can get this connected and you're using paid apps, paid advertising, you can actually determine if it worked. You know, whether that ad unit was a good unit. And in some cases, particularly with iAds, what you need to do to fix this is extremely counterintuitive. Uh, well, could because when you normally advertise, you want to get as many downloads as possible, but that may not be the case. You may want to pay more for users because those users are better users. Really critical. So this is some numbers in terms of, it's pretty close, it's only a few months old, but it's basically what it takes to get to certain spots in, um, in the um, app store. So 
like for example, to get the number six in all apps, something like 60,000 or more, probably more now, but that's what it is. It's just numbers for your benefit, no big deal. So the App Store changed uh, several months ago, and what they did is they made it even more fun for us. They basically took something where we used to see a bunch of apps in a column, and they basically reduced it to a very few, uh, and they even made it much harder because when you actually did a search, you used to get a series of apps, now you get one and you have to slide through them. Why this is important is that you'll get often pushed into what's called a burst campaign. That is, you get a bunch of cheap, useless users that pushes you up into the charts, something we'll talk, they call it incentive, and that way you get, you know, because you're high in the charts, people will see your app and download it, you get a lot of organic users. Well, it isn't so as much as it used to be because of this change, and in a couple of weeks we're gonna see another change, and it's gonna be even more the case, so I would be aware of that. Um, so, the new app store, both what we have now, the categories are completely hidden, takes more taps, SEO and screenshots matter a lot. Your first screenshot and your icon matters more. The burst mode, when I talk about, is really not that effective. Channels are important. Apple does this because Apple wants this to be a meritocracy. They're tired of people gaming the app store. They will constantly go after anything that games the app store. They want it to be completely based on the merits of the game. That's what you have to understand. That's Apple's point of view. And I think Google is the same way. Uh, paid apps are a real pain in the ass um, because there's no ad channel that you can use that will let you acquire them for less than they cost. You can't go out and advertise a paid app and have a cost per install that actually is uh, less than the price. I haven't seen it. So what people do is they do things like free app a day or Appalicious where they'll take the app free for a day and hopefully enough people will download it so that they'll talk to their friends or get enough notice. Um, having a social aspect helps. Um, right now, top 10 of 10 grossing titles are free. When I last talked about this uh, seven months ago, it was eight out of 10. But, um, you know, there are some titles where being paid would make a lot of sense. Um, you can't raise prices very easily either, so sometimes, you know, people are starting to actually consider switching to paid, and we'll talk about some examples of that. I know that's completely against what everyone says, but my CEO, who is not a game person, but is a finance and software person, yells at me all the time about this freemium stuff is terrible, we should do more paid apps, and I think I'm beginning to think he has a good point. So, so if you're doing an app that's niche, has a special appeal, maybe you should do paid. Um, you know, you can do simpler titles. You don't have to have IAP. You can just do a game that's a good game and make it a paid app. So I guess what I'm saying is if I was an independent developer and I was just doing a game on my own, I'd consider doing a paid app. I really would because, you know, if you've got a niche that no one else is hitting, um, it's a lot simpler and, and it's a simpler proposition. Either it hits it or it doesn't. I mean, you can, most likely, to be honest, your game is not gonna be a success, but at least with a paid app, you didn't, you didn't have to go off and engineer this entire in-app purchase, digital loaded content monstrosity. You could basically just do a game that you care about and see if it takes off. I know, oh my God, I'm gonna get a lot of trouble with this one. But, um, uh, you know, multiplayer apps is a big problem though because multiplayer apps need scale so that there's always someone to play you and all that, so. Um, you know, I know someone who's doing a paid app that's gonna go out in the app store for $9.95 and I think it's gonna be a hit, so. I think this could happen more often than you think. Um, so there's a freemium chart. It's all freemium, 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 blue. Let's talk about premium apps. Here's the Minecraft app. What's funny about Minecraft is I forgot about this, but there's another app in the App Store which is also paid, which is a clone of Minecraft, and it's actually doing better than Minecraft. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's a, but Minecraft is selling for $4.99. Why? Because it's a name brand. People know what it is. It's a brand. And I think the other niche here is the big adventure games. So uh, adventure games are based on PC games that people know and love, or just beautiful grant, you know, artistic efforts. They're going to be probably better as paid apps. They don't make, it's kind of hard to do an adventure game which has a beginning, middle, and end as a DLC loaded app, unless you just do chapters, which, which could work. You know, you can make a free first chapter and then people can decide whenever they play it. The, the Silent Age is gonna do that, I believe. The Silent Age is an adventure game doing that. So I'm, I'm actually going to basically say, when everyone says do something, like in a stock market, when everyone says do this, quite often the thing to do is to be a contrarian. So for some of you and some of us, we maybe make sense to do some paid apps uh, just because no one else is.
Come on, swipe. Okay. So niches are great. I have to do a Rush picture because we're in Canada. Um, <laughs> Rush is an interesting band. I'm not a fan of theirs. But when I, you know, I see them occasionally on videos, they're really freaking talented, and they have an audience that they serve. So I'm going to give you a, an, uh, an opportunity here. There's a game called Hunted Rogues on iOS. There's a website called Something Awful. Does anyone know what Something Awful is? Mm -hmm. It's a sort of, you have to pay to join and it's a discussion and you can get banned really easy. But they talk about a lot of things. Their iOS form is always interesting. And they bitch about 100 Rogues all the time as being a bad game. Uh, and it's got a lot of bugs. But you know, there's an opportunity. Some of them, you know, one thing to do is actually, if you like something, find out what's going on in that something in the iOS store. If you're, if you're a big fan of hexagon-based, turn-based war games, See what's out there. Is anything good? And, you know, sometimes stuff that you care about is uh, you know really cool stuff. And we have our niche product ourselves, which I will bring up, which is Bocce. And um, really good story and dumb story at the same time. I have to admit, I feel dumb. But there's a reason why it happened. It wasn't that we were like trying to be stupid. We had no. Tr we were sort of trapped at the time. We'll talk about that. Um, a lot of the success in the Apple Store is based on this. Um, Romeo did 52 games for Angry Birds, or you get a license. Um, here's something sad. Um, Yeti Zen disclosed to a bunch of us at a conference that if you got a great review on 148 apps, that would mean 1,000 additional downloads of a free app. Let that sink in. There's so much talk about getting a review on Touch Arcade or 148 apps. But the sad story, at least from what I've seen and talked to on developers, it doesn't mean a lot in downloads. So if you disagree, do you disagree? No, I agree with you. Okay, yeah, good. They, they <laughs> yeah, if, I'm, if you say I'm wrong, tell me, please. So a lot of it is kind of luck. I mean, Tiny Wings is a beautiful app that did a beautiful job of a video, and Bocce Ball was a complete freaking surprise to us. We'll get to that, because it's just maddening in a way. I've had apps featured by Apple. It's great when it happens. Um, you have to be really excellent, and it gets hard. Um, uh, you know, and Apple is doing some weird things. Um, back in when I wrote this initial talk, 11 out of the top 18 games and new and noteworthy were paid. So Apple's biasing their feature to paid apps. So I, I don't know. That's in, that seems interesting to me. Um, this is the best example of dumb luck. These guys put out this craptastic app, and if there's anyone here from this company, I'm sorry, it's really a horrible game <laughs> called Save the Titanic. And look at the reviews, it's just funny. But they called it Save the Titanic, and sure enough, boom, it was at the point in time when the top three iPhone apps at the time, you know, game apps, when it came out. Um, and you can see this, this chart below in, in uh, in one of the app uh, chart things. So, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, that's funny. I, I tried to do a topical app once and I really got burned by it, so I don't recommend that. Like doing an app tied to a news event, Apple really frowns on that and they, will, they might delay you and all that, but you know, sometimes that could work. Um, so what are the channels you can use? Uh, iAds, everyone, this is iAds. But, you know, I've gotten it down to a, like a buck 20, uh, in terms of a CPI, a cost per install from iAds, and I, I just feel in some ways these users are quality. Now, I think it's good to run iAds, and it's good for the relationship. And by that I mean, by that I don't mean that it could possibly help you get an app approved or an update approved faster, because if I said that, that would be really wrong. So I'm not saying that, but you know, whatever. You get the hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, so it's, um, it's, the trick to this is to make ads, since you pay per click, the trick to this is to be contrary and make an ad that users who would never play that game or probably won't love that game would never click on. Because you're only paying per clicks, you're not paying per views. So do an ad that says, you have to be a complete maniac to play this game because it's only for maniacs. Or you have to basically love news puzzles and word puzzles to play this game. Otherwise, don't click here. You know, that's what you want to do. You want to actually minimize the number, the click rate. Minimize the click rate, and that's how you drive the cost per install down with iPhones. Not what iAds, not what do you expect. But Apple really does care about this. The iAd people are wonderful, and they're really a good sounding board. They can help you out. Um, <laughs> sent a video, I love this slide. Okay, I am, 
not a fan of incentive video. This is not incentive downloads. Incentive video is where someone watches a video and earns in-game currency or items on another app. Now, I use this for revenue all the time, so because it's, it's pretty good revenue. You know, you put it in your game, you say, watch this video and earn a credit. But the problem is, people aren't that smart. And what happens is people watch the video and then they download the app anyway, even though they don't have to. They just do this. And, I, and I'm telling you, I've seen people go on stage from the various people who run incentive videos and swear that these are good users. I don't think they're good users. I'm sorry. I, I've, I've actually done analysis of looking at cohort analysis, looking at the UDIDs of people who came in for an incentive video campaign. And I think a lot of them make a mistake when they download the app. They just, don't, they just download it because they think they have to. Um, it can be pretty cheap if you do a great video. Great videos matter. We, you know, sometimes they'll say they'll make a video for you. If you're going to do this, for don't let them make a video for you. Do a really cool video. And I would say that our, our guys did a really great video. Um, you can't get that much volume, maybe a thousand a day. Um, and uh, if you want to see great examples of how good videos can be, if you look up our play screen channel on uh, YouTube, you look at Crickler before and after or, or Word Carnival, you'll see how cool videos can be. But once again, even with great videos, I'm kind of concerned that we don't get good users from it. So I'm not a big fan of it. Um, incentive downloads, they're not quite dead yet. Um, and they're only useful to get into the charts. And you really have to be careful because the users are really craptastic. Um, sorry. Uh, here they are. Um, this chart is still true. 3% of the incentive downloads use the app often, 18% occasionally, and there you go for the rest of them. They don't, and, and, I, and I think that's true. I don't think the incentive users stay around. The only reason to do incentive is to spend a lot of money in one day or, and get into the charts. Um, so you need to drive you know, 30 to 40,000 downloads. You may not be able to get your volume. Everyone else is trying to do this as well, so you almost have to make sure whoever you're dealing with gets you that slot to get those incentive uh, downloads so you can get into the charts. I have done this. I've done this three times and I regret it horribly. But um, yeah, you know, it's just, this is common wisdom. We used to use an agency that basically handled all our um, user acquisitions and we followed their advice and not that they were wrong, but you know, they had a, they had a stake in, you know, their, their, their uh, business is basically their business and your business is your business. Your business is staying in business by basically spending less than you're going to earn from your app. So I'm not recommending the incentive downloads, I'm sorry. Like I say, not all cost per install is equal. I think the incentive users really kill real-time multiplayer games. This is an insight we have because we have a poker app. What happened with us is we did a huge incentive burst Get into the charts, got a lot of people into the poker game, and what did they do? They all they had to do was run the app once, but what they did is they ran the app and sat in the tables and did nothing. For weeks we sat there watching people just sitting at the tables and auto-folding, you know, just not raising or calling or anything. And it drove the other players nuts and they left. That really happened. So I watch out for that. Organic downloads you get are good. It depends on the game. I mean, some games. Who cares if, if those people never play the game again? They're not going to ruin it, but multiplayer games, it can hurt it. Um, and I think in general, one of the things I believe is that ad-driven users, as opposed to organics, no matter what the ad is, they're not going to convert as well. Word of mouth users are going to convert the best. You know, if some friend tells you to buy a game, you're most likely going to play it because there's a good chance it'll stay sticky. I saw someone talk about a statistic that said 50% of the users that come to the game will stay and become daily players. I go, yeah, it, yeah, could happen, but it, actually I think the number is usually quite less, so, yeah. And as I said before, this K-Factor thing, very few games grow via invites, Draw Something being the amazing game. I, I, I do think that the original Draw Something, the original launch, is a very important app to understand the iOS market. It, it, the reason why I say that is because it was so much simpler than the apps that preceded it. So you had all these, um, what do you call that in the... Uh, when the charades, or not the charades, but there's a name for it when you do it in parties. They had all these apps that were like that, where you drew things and people had to guess what you were drawing. There were a bunch of them, people don't know that. There were tons of them, but they were much more complicated. They had rooms where multiple people were watching in real time what you were drawing. And what they did with Draw Something is because they were running out of money, 
they basically stripped down the app and made it just an asynchronous, you know, I'll draw something as you can watch it being drawn and anytime you want, you can decide if you can answer it. It's basically a volley. There was no win or lose. You try to hit the ball across the net as much as possible before the ball falls down, before someone can't guess it. And the other one, of course, is CSR Racing, which I was stunned at because there's nothing you do there but hold the button down and shift, right? Boom, boom. But it, that's what people want. So in terms of design, Draw Something was really cool. And there was no way to play the game unless you invited a Facebook friend. That was a big deal. Um, what can you do besides add? Press and reviews are great, you can't depend on it. Co-promotion with brands, I've done a lot of that. Um, it's hard. Uh, if you can get a brand deal uh, where they are promoting your product, so be it. I worked a year to get Ford to run puzzles in our crossword game, and when I was finally done and they did it, uh, they determined that they needed board approval to do a press release, so we couldn't do a press release, and, and all they did was post on their Facebook page. But it drove thousands of users to the game. I just wanted to help out Ford as well, and you know that was a disappointment. Um, but it was cool that I closed the deal with Ford, so yeah, that was kind of nice. You know. um, Contests, I've done a lot of contests, very hard to pull off. I did a contest where I built a Facebook app. We built a Facebook app so that two schools, rival schools, could play a word game and win hundreds of dollars in prizes, and we advertised at the schools with flyers. We built a Facebook app so they could you know, just sign into Facebook and then get the app on their phone and play. Not that big of a success. Um, the, 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 using your own channel, the best example of that is the NG Moco company when they first did the iPhone store. This is something I wish I had done. When the iPhone store first opened up, big land rush, NG Moco puts out a free app that's decent, and they give it away with no ads, they don't care. They just give away the app, and we're all sitting here wondering what they were doing, but what they did is they built themselves a channel. And this is really becoming the key to success. The key to success is success. Once you have an app that has a lot of players in it, um, you know, um, you can do it. You know, you can get a click-through rate of greater than 12%, and you can get 16% of those people completing the download if you have your own channel, and then the app makes sense for those users. So, NG Moco did that. The other thing you can do is partner with other app developers and promote their apps, and they promote yours. Um, that's co-promotion. I actually think, this got criticized badly yesterday, but I have to disagree. This is so much more sensible. If I were to say this in a nutshell, I'd say don't spend any money promoting your app before you do everything like this. And obviously you want to tune your app before you start promoting it in the first place. Obviously you want to do testing and all that. But co-promotion, yeah, I'm sacrificing my revenue. Oh my God. But you know, what you're doing is you're basically finding a way that people can find out about your app without spending cash. No matter what you, you're, you're not paying cash. You're not spending capital. You're basically, giving up revenue that you may or may not have, but at least you're getting users into the game. Once you have a success, you have a channel. Are you gonna close that door? Yeah, thank you. Oh, let's talk about how to fail. There's so many ways to fail, so many ways to die. Uh, you don't sell you the store, you spend without measuring, you depend on PR, you don't have the resources for revision and market. That's a really important one, I should have bolded that. You have to revise your title, and you have to eventually do some marketing but the worst one is you don't nail monetization, because that's a sad one. That really is sad. You get a title out there, it does well, and whoops, I don't know how I'm making money from this title. Let's talk about that. Um, Punch Quest, great title. Um, basically, they get $600,000 in a week, and they get only $10,000 in revenue, which isn't enough. Um, and they eventually just say, screw it, they move to a paid model. Um, you know, basically, uh, so it's 99 cents, they said we have to either go 99 cents or we have to increase the price of everything by eight times or more. This is, this is why I'm becoming like, okay, maybe sometimes you have to do a paid app. So Punch Quest is an interesting example. The next one is Bomb Cats. 100,000 downloads in one day, which is magnificent. Everyone loves the app, but only 100 people do an IAP. Only do 100 people do an in-app purchase. Um, you know, basically the studio is shutting down because of it, that's what I was told. You know, it's just um, too generous. You know, they didn't, maybe they just didn't, they didn't tune the freemium, they didn't do it. So what people are trying to do now is launch the app in a limited geographic area and figure this all out. But this is sad. But of course, he was without stupidity, let them cast the first stone, and this is my stupid moment. Um, Bocce Ball was a weird app, because PlayScreen was formed in, the PlayScreen company was actually formed in 2010, end of 2010, but what happened was, Sherry and I had a company, the, the CTO and I had a company 
called My New Mobile, which had the name play screen that started in 2006 and did things like the first iPhone web games and all that. And so Bocce Ball was originally a work for hire project for a Bocce Ball company. At the very last minute, I went to them and said, look, we'll keep your ad in there, but let us own the IP, you don't have to pay us anything more. It was not a high budget item. The, the, the key idea here, which worked really well, that really pulled up well, was that if it felt like paper toss, but you were playing bocce, perhaps it could be popular. Well, it got very popular. It got number one in Italy organically, about a cent being spent. And with a little bit of advertising in the US, it got number six in all apps, one million downloads. Can you guess what went wrong here? Well, what went wrong here is there's a line from Hunter S. Thompson in the Curse of Lono where he says, why do they lie to us? On the revenue side, you will be told all sorts of story about CPM and how much money you're going to make from a particular ad unit. Um, I mean, how do you tell if an ad uh, representative is lying? His lips are moving. I don't know. We were, in one case, the reason why I'm so mad about this is that in one case, a European ad provider gave us a quote on what we could expect in effective CPM, effective dollars per thousand impressions, and they delivered one one hundredth of that. One one hundredth. So an app that had all those impressions, it was an ad supported app, boom. So what we did since then is we added, uh, this didn't have real multiplayer, this was just hand off the phone or play against the iPhone. We built multiplayer in, had some issues with that, and eventually I think what we're gonna do is fix the multiplayer and just turn it into a paid app or the or maybe just make the multiplayer a in-app purchase but you know what are you going to do to uh, mod to put you know DLC into a bocce thing sell backgrounds sell different colored walls I mean it's, it's 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 silly here's an app that's the number one it's still the number one bocce ball game on the iPhone and it's it's still and it has that retention that retention that looked really great that's bocce ball and you know and didn't even build an Italian version, so that's a sad story, really sad story. <laughs> so how to win? Let's talk about winning. Sorry about this picture, you know, but anyway, hey. Um, <laughs> um, so you, you know, basically you really have to know the category you're in or just get darn lucky. You don't spend any money about testing. You launch a limited area, which I kind of wish I did more often. And you have some resources there for revision or marketing and marketing. Not necessarily you're going to have to spend money on it, but you're going to basically be able to revise the product and, and make it better and better. And you nail some monetization model, which could be, in the case of Bocce, I am almost certain if we made it a paid out, we would make far more money from it. Um, CSR Racing is perfect. Um, they basically earn more than $12 million a month. They, they do really well. Uh, they didn't spend, they claim they spent no user acquisition. Money. They claim that this is an all organic product. That may be true, that may not be true, but they did it. And hats off to them because they built an app that was strong enough and simple enough. I mean, when, when you think that you can't simplify anything further on the iPhone, someone does something like this. I knew driving games, I've been in the video game industry since, you know, I, I was at Activision in the 80s and 90s, and I was at, in video games even before that, you know. so. To think that a driving game can be nothing more than push a button to shift is a surprise, but you know, I'm sure I'm gonna get surprised again, so hats off to them. This is the most amazing, crazy story. Um, this company now is worth more than Mazda, Japan Airlines, or Nintendo. The company is worth more. It's, this app really is making $4 million a day. That is not a lie. But I met the guy, he was at E3, and he gave, not E3, at GDC, and he gave a long talk. And what they did is this. They knew this category. They started out building titles in Japan. They focused on Japan. They focused on what they knew. And they used their existing titles as they jumper jacked it. They sort of like, they sort of like bootstrapped from their title. They did one title that was pretty good. And they used that title to introduce a new title, a new title, a new title. How popular is this? 10% of every man, woman, and child in Japan is playing this game right now. 10% of the freaking population in Japan, but it's a Japanese game. It doesn't necessarily do well anywhere else. Gee, I wish I had a game that was successful in a company, a country that was a leader. Mm, yeah, I did, right? So, you know, <laughs> stupid me. Um, don't do this, please. Don't do this. These people are gonna get their asses kicked out of the uh, app store any minute now, but it is a very funny slide, so I had to put it up there. This is a complete ripoff, and I love the language. Fondle admiringly, yes, very good. 
And this happens a lot. People try to do these stupid, stupid tricks, and Apple catches them at it. But there you go. And Apple can actually withhold um, money from you. Okay, so let's talk about tuning monetization. This is called funnel analysis. So in this case, we're looking at people buying puzzle credits in our crossword game, Crickler, which is a cool game. And you can see that you know um, people hit the uh, they hit the hint press, uh, they buy hints, and they go, and some of them go to the buy hint screen. So 37% do that, and then 47% of the people who actually go to the buy hint screen actually complete the transaction. And there you go. And what we try to do is change the stuff to improve that. But that's a funnel analysis. I'm using Absolar as a uh, an analytical tool. There's also Contagion in Yesterday, I guess there was um, uh, Fuse or something like that, a new company. Fusebox. Fusebox, yeah. So there's a bunch of companies there doing this, and this is a really good way to tune the app. And I know of a company that does very well out of Los Angeles, and they actually use New Zealand as their test, and they did this with a golf game where they just kept working on this and working on this when I was in New Zealand, getting it right and then bringing it to the United States. A lot of the problem is that when you're a small company, and you're running off of uh, the kindness of someone who's put money into the company or you're running off your own pocket, you just feel so compelled to get the app out there. You just want to get it out there. You don't want to do the freaking geographic tests. Well, if it's a freemium game, it might be a good idea to do that. Just, you know, just to get it right. Um, okay, so I actually was at Activision for six years. Eventually I became the vice president of technology at Activision and I left at 94 because I was an idiot. No, no, because I, Wanted to do educational software for a while, but anyway, that's a slide my um, son always sends me, my youngest son, it says Activision board meeting. The part that says board meeting is cut off because he does not like Activision, but <laughs> I know Bobby Kotick, I knew him before Activision, so why I actually probably stayed at that. was probably left to be, well, I probably wasn't canned at Activision because he knew me from before Activision. And what I'm saying here is that maybe a publisher is a good idea. I think, I, I have changed my thinking on this. Um, here's why. What I've seen happen is you build an app that you test really thoroughly, that has in-app purchases, that's fun. I mean, I have one app where I've seen people play the game for 11 hours at a time, at a stretch, because I can see that, right? That's pretty cool. And you go out there and you go to advertisers, you do fantastic video ads, you do beautifully creative banner ads, and what you find out is you're spending more to acquire real players than you're making. With a publisher, it's not that complicated. They're gonna decide whether they want your app or not. They're gonna take half the money, if you're smart, you won't make them. You won't let them do things like marketing uh, cost deductions. You'll just say, "No, this is a straight deal. You're going to pay me half of what you earn, and you're going to commit to a certain amount of marketing." It's simpler, and, and in some cases, what these publishers have is they have channel. Uh, they have products out there with a lot of users, and now they can go off and think about it from their point of view. It's like Bam, for example, is now doing publishing. Why? Because they have products that have a lot of strong IAP and they have room to put the ads in there. So what they figure is they can cherry pick apps that could make money, and rather than going off and spending money in advertising, they can use their existing apps, put ads for these apps in, and they can, you know, they can basically uh, harvest cash. Why would developers go with this? Because they've got a channel. You're, yes, you're giving away half your revenue, but it's certainly better than spending three or four times what your revenue is and not succeeding. And I really believe that you hear a lot of stuff at, this, um, um, co at these conferences and from how great it is to make money on these apps, but you're once again, survival bias. You're hearing from the people who have succeeded, you're not hearing from the 100 people who have not succeeded and have done good work. So I'm actually becoming much more of a fan of publishing. You don't know what they know, blah, 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 blah. Publishers are not a terrible thing. Yeah, I really believe that. The future, I have to do this to BlackBerry, sorry. I've been making fun of BlackBerry ever since they did that. The CEO from BlackBerry made a uh, comment on that. Um, so one of the things I quoted here was, you know, desktop sales outnumbered smartphone sales. Mobile internet traffic was 1% of all traffic. Tablets did not exist, that was 2009. Heck, I started doing iOS stuff in 2007. Things changed fast. Um, I believe the tablets are going to continue to grow. Sorry, Mr. CEO of BlackBerry. I think the TV platforms are starting to show up. They're here now. Um, I suspect that the console wars are actually going to benefit everyone in the long run. What I mean by that is I think you're going to see reasonable digital stores appear on the consoles. 
where you're going to be able to be an independent developer and get your app out on the consoles. Now, Microsoft's played around that with, you know, X, I guess XPlay and a couple other things. But I think Sony's going to do it in a big way. Sony's actually committed to doing that. And um, I, I, I worry about Nintendo. I, I, I follow Nintendo. They've been the best video game publisher, video game console company for a long time, but I think they might be losing it. So besides that, you have Oya. Now, I get, I get the hate for Oya, I mean, the uh, Android um, little cube console. But I have a friend, well, a guy I've known for a long time, who runs a company called Handy Games in Germany. And he is no dummy. He's bootstrapped that company, he makes good money. I think he has 1% of all Google Play downloads right now, is Handy Games. And he's supporting Oya. And he's supporting Google Glasses, uh, you know, eventually. But he's supporting Oya right now. Why? Because they aren't there. there. You know, there aren't that many strong publishers on there, developers on there. So he's doing it just to basically have a niche. And I look back to the companies I started that did really well, like the Aegis company. Aegis was a company that we started in 85, um, and we started out as a Mac game developer. But when this thing called the Amiga came out, we jumped on it with both feet, and we owned the Amiga for a number of years. We did really well on that. Well, I think Chris Kostolewski, I can't pronounce his last name, believes that he can own the Oya. He does kind of cute, niche games that make sense on that platform, that makes sense on a TV platform. And so there's, and there are other things like this. You know, I'm not going to say, say to you, but there are things that are like, yeah, they're mobile apps, but they're, they're like, almost like a separate platform because they're doing things that you can't do all over the world. Um, and there are people who are acting like, like platform people in that space. Um, and I think the, the time for premium apps is now. I think it's because everything has now gone freemium. Everyone ran, you know, the industry is like six-year-old kids playing soccer. Wherever the ball is, Everyone runs to that ball. They have no discipline. There's no one staying near the goal. There's no one staying in the midfield. They all run to the goal, to the ball. And so everyone ran to freemium because that made sense. And yes, I think you can make money on freemium. And actually, freemium is almost like a science in the way you test monetization and funnels and stuff. But you know, if everyone's running in that direction, hmm. You know, I'll tell you, if Apple had a price that was, when you buy this app, you get a dollar in your pocket, developers would do it. The race to the bottom would never end. Um, you know, I almost wish they never had free apps, but they do. So what I'm saying is there is a possibility that other things could happen. Um, nothing helps reduce the cost of acquisition like a great game. You know, um, you can't push garbage, and Apple is going to basically continue to make sure you can't. Everyone had the reason why Apple shut down the TapJoy stuff. If you remember, TapJoy had a thing going on in the app where you could download an app and get currency for your app, for your, the app you were playing, and Apple shut them down. Because at one point in time, people don't remember this, there were apps in the top slots that didn't even run. They didn't work, they crashed. And they were like number one, number two apps because they were going off and spending 50, 60, $70,000 with TapJoy and getting into position. Apple doesn't like that. And I don't think, my, and I don't think uh, Google does either. Oh, and in terms of niche platforms, we have a beautiful example here. In Ottawa, we have Magmic. And what Magmic did is they established a relationship with BlackBerry. And they are BlackBerry's favorite game developer. And they get positioning and stuff. And even though I'm not a BlackBerry fan, um, I admired that, you know? Now I tried to do that once, I'll tell you a funny story. We had 20 web apps. And there was a platform coming out called the Palm Pre. Does anyone remember the Palm Pre? So we had all these HTML, Ajax web apps, Blackjack, um, Backgammon, Bowling, good, solid mobile apps. You can see them if you go to our website. They're still there on the web. You can run them on your iPhone. So we, and, and what's more, the guy I worked with in the early 80s was the head of evangelism for Pre. Oh my god, I was excited. You know, we're going to get all these apps. We're going to dominate the Pre, right? New, new machine? They lost the files at launch. <laughs> They literally lost the files of launch, one of the most heartbreaking moments of my life. So, strange things happen. Um, gotta get a high rating. Uh, you know, we're now shooting for four and a half stars. We've had some apps actually hold that five star average rating for a while. It matters. Sorry. And you gotta study everything that goes on. And here's the thing if you get any sort of hit, you gotta feed that cow. So, 
Why didn't we do anything about Bocce? Well, we didn't do anything about Bocce because Bocce was a minor project, and we had a major project with a major license attached to it. Something went wrong there, but at the time, that was our company. We had a goal to ship this product. We had contracts to ship a product by a certain date that involved everyone in the company. We couldn't give Bocce the attention it deserved. Hindsight, I'd like to kick myself. I'd like to go back in time and say, you idiot. Bocce's success, start, spend extra money, get a team that, that did it to keep revising it, keep looking at it, add stuff to it, turn on multiplayer, do it right, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't do that because there was an obligation and a bigger thing that had to be done. I would strongly recommend if you get any kind of traction on a title, you just stay with it. You know, um, the best example of this, I think, is Nimblebit. Nimblebit had some sort of fun app. I think they even had a word game. And then they did something, I think it was Tiny Tower or one of the apps before that, and it succeeded. And what they did is they made a decision, that's our business. We're going to do those type of apps, those pixelated, 88-bit video game graphic, churn and burn, you know, you know, grind apps. You know, we know that well. We succeeded. And they're going to keep doing it because that works for them. So you can't, you got to do that. You know, um, this is not easy. And whatever I say today or anyone says is going to change. It just does. You know, um, the only, uh, you know, no one knows anything. People have done crazy things and succeeded. And that's why I advise not just following the pack. Um, it's a very difficult affair. Uh, even if you do everything that everyone tells you to do, you probably have a good chance of failure. If you're going to fail, at least fail spectacularly or fail painlessly and do small apps or whatever. But, you know, this is really difficult stuff. You know, look how Rovio was close to being out of business. The draw something people were pretty much out of business when that happened. I know a lot of stories like that. And I was at a company where this happened. I was at a company where we were ready to go under. And that was Activision. People don't remember this, but we were down to 12 people at Activision in 1992 when we moved from Northern California to Southern California. And we had an app that had, a game that had failed miserably called Lever Goddess of Phobos 2. It was panned beyond belief. And we were a bunch of people in a, in a building in chapter 11, wondering if we would have jobs tomorrow, and we basically decided, you know, it's like, um, we decided, who cares? We, we're just gonna go for it. And we did a title called Return to Zork that succeeded really well. And Bobby was able to go off and raise money on that, and the, the follow-on success, which was Mech Warrior 2, which took six years to come out, by the way. And that was that. So there's something to be said for being under pressure, but there's something to be said for just taking the, the jump and doing something that doesn't make any sense. You know, and in the case of Return to Zork, the secret to that product was that we were so angry about the other product that we made the game impossible. We deliberately made the game 100% unfair. There are people bitching about it on YouTube to this day, and it was what made it succeed. Totally contrary. Um, yeah, so, all right, so, we have some time, and I am open to criticism and, and comments. So go for, go for it. Questions, stories, you know. Um, what was the one I was gonna? I didn't want to say. Oh, I've, this is the first time I've been in Ottawa for 40 years. Yeah. I was 60 year old, and I rode my bicycle to here from New York, and I didn't look behind me, and I swerved to avoid a ditch and got hit by a car, but I didn't get hurt, and I proceeded to hitch across Canada when I was 16 years old. So that's my Ottawa story. So, yes. Go on, go on, do you have a question? Uh, if I could find it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're saying that you would limit yourself to limited testing or launch? No, I would, I would actually go to like, well, the big country we do in the United States is Canada. I would launch in a limited geographic area with the app and I'd measure stuff, particularly on a premium, freemium app. I would try really hard to find a geographic area that's limited and tune the app. I know a company that did a, uh, uh, golf game, miniature golf game, and they did that with New Zealand, and it worked out really well. They showed me their funnels before and after all the changes, and they were able to improve the product enough, and then when they went worldwide, they made a lot of money on it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yes? How long did you spend tuning the app? I don't know. I mean, um, we had one game called Carnival, where we were Carnival, we spent like uh, a month tuning the app, but you know, there's this, once again, this enormous pressure. I mean, I would say there's a Creative tension exists between the development group and the marketing group in every company. Development really wants the app to get out there. And marketing is like, could we do this? Could we do that? And I've had people yell at me on the phone, don't you ask us to add anything to the app. You guys should be able to make it work. You should be able to get the reviews. You should, and, and, 
it's, you know, it's just, it's, this stuff hasn't changed in 30 years. The same stuff that went on at Activision, went on at Aegis, went on, on at Avalon Hill, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, but it wasn't, you know, and I'm gonna tell you something, I feel bad for people in the, in, in the game industry coming out of schools now because it's so much harder to get anywhere in this business. It used to be a lot simpler. I mean, I know people who started out at the shipping dock at EA who ended up running whole companies 10 years later. That ain't happening anymore. So you have to be so good now to make anything happen. Everything is much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? What, uh, what weight do you think the brand holds? A hell of a lot more than it used to. I think it matters now. It depends on what the brand is. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, Telltale Games has a play solo player's poker game that just came out, right? It's, it's not multiplayer, um, it's solo play. But they've basically gotten licensed to a whole bunch of video game characters and they shoved them in there. And this is a paid app. It's called Poker Night. Now Telltale has, a, like, has some cachet because they did the Walking Dead games. Uh, but I don't know if people recognize Telltale, but when they look at the screenshots and you see guys from, uh, you know, they see the uh, bot robot from Portal and they see the character from, uh, got the cartoon series, you know, whatever it is. What? Venture Brothers. Venture Brothers, they see other characters, they chuckle and they hit the buy button. Um, other examples of brands that matter. Um, Titanic, that was an example of a brand, even though there's no brand called Titanic. They named the game Titanic. People looked at that icon and they recognized Titanic and they bought this, you know, they downloaded this craptastic game, which is really craptastic. Um, yeah, I think brand matters a lot. The one of the reasons why we were so focused on the poker title is that we had a very strong brand license attached to it, but Black Friday took that brand away from us. So uh, I'm lucky to be standing here. I'm, I'm actually lucky that things have progressed since then because that was a really bad thing to actually lose a major license, a major brand like that. Because we, my plan was to be like the John Madden football of poker, to have the best people involved with the game and it's gonna be awesome. And then when that didn't happen, we had to go back to uh, square one. And what we've done is, what we're going to do is we're going to have a strong brand attached to it again, but a brand from a different type of space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, swinging away from the premium model into a uh, premium or paid model. Um, what about that for uh, a low budget or zero budget startup, and how do you get that organic growth through that model? Okay, well, like I mentioned, I think the, the Bocce game and the Rogues game are interesting examples because. If there's a niche that you care about or you know about and it's not being served, perhaps an independent company can release a game that appeals to that niche and takes off. So I think adventure games are sort of becoming like that. There, there's a lot of cute little adventure games that are doing well because people want them. If you can find something that existed in the past that was a big retro game that people loved and you could re-release it, I mean, my God, if I get the license to return to Zork, I would do it because it would be awesome. I could release it at a $9 game and probably get away with it. Um, but even if it's a small, simple, casual game, uh, there's been some examples where people have just pulled something off that was just different and unique and had people who were wanting to play that game. Yes, it's much clearer that it, you can actually follow the freemium route, route with in-app purchases and tune it up and all that, but it may be easier for an independent developer. This is, once again, completely against what everyone is saying. Everyone now is the top trots are all freemium apps and blah, blah, blah. I think a small developer could come up with a niche that would be a fun game that people would care about and they would uh, want to play it and they might want to pay for it. It would you know, it'd have to be something that would take off viral or virally. It'd have to be something that was a hit. I mean, yes, it's, it's a crapshoot. But currently, I think, you know, if, if, uh, if one-tenth of a percent of the games are making half the money, clearly a lot of apps are just bombing like can be, you know, like mad. So, um, you know, doing something completely different and unique as a paid app, in a way, is a simpler strategy. You can't, you don't have to worry about marketing spend because it is impossible. <laughs> Other than maybe 25K to free app a day and see what happens, you can't go off and run those ad campaigns. So there is something you don't have to do. You don't have to worry about engineering the in-app purchases and the digitally loaded content because you can't. It's a, you know, it's a paid app. You're not going to, there are some paid apps called, um, uh, Paymium or whatever you want to call it, where they have an app items and they're paid app, but that's rare. So, you know, um, yeah, I'm being, I'm basically saying, you know, screw it. You might as well try doing a paid app if you, you know, if, if you think you have something that's kind of unique and stands out. Why not? You know, I wish I'd done that for Bocce. If I'd done that for Bocce, 
I would have made 10 times as much money as I did from blockchain. Yes? Um, take away or walk away from the, the mobile. Um, the premium category, which succeeds more in social or mobile? I think it succeeds more in social, uh, mobile. I mean, social's actually gotten worse because what happened there in the history of social games, mainly Facebook game, is that there was a golden goose called Facebook where you could put out a social game and the social game, whenever you did something, would let your friends know what was going on. That golden goose got, got abused by a certain company whose mascot is a dog. And because of that, Facebook clamped down. Now it's freaking expensive to promote a game on Facebook. End of story. Um, there are new social networks appearing elsewhere, like in Asia and stuff, that might be better. So I would look at that. Yeah, Congregate's pretty good. Congregate's decent. They make a lot of, people make a lot of revenue on Congregate. I'm just saying, you don't think there's going to be a new Facebook and the social network? You well, start again with the game. you know, Facebook is sort of like Microsoft when the Xbox 360 was, came out. They're benefiting from the complete screw-up that is Google+. Plus. I mean, if only Google had a mobile software division, if only. Maybe they could have put it out a mobile API so that games could be released and use the Google Plus graph. If only they had that. But I guess they didn't have anything like that. Yeah. Google is the most stovepipe company I can't imagine. The Chrome people don't talk to the Android people. The Android people don't talk to the Google Plus people. It, it's stupid. I'm sorry, I'm going to call it right now. Google Plus had the opportunity to take away Facebook's business. They have a clean interface, but it's so unsocial. I mean, I, you know, I always tell people, when I, when I need some time to relax, I post something on Google Plus because then I can just sit back and enjoy the silence. You know, I've got 5,000 people in my circle on Google Plus. I've got 2,000 on Facebook. If I post on Facebook, I'm going to get responses. If I post them on Google Plus, I, I used to, I actually used to post posts with, um, with the uh, video of a cricket chirping because it's literally a dead zone. And it's Google's fault. They didn't release an API. They should have, when the data thing came out, it should have been baked into Android and it should have been iOS API so you could have used that as your graph. Everyone was tired of Facebook. Everyone wanted to use them. Oh, enough of that rant. <laughs> yes, I want to get in trouble for that. Yeah. Guy Kawasaki's never going to forgive me. Yeah. yeah. Any more? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that paid apps are going to work for you. I'm just saying that premium apps free aren't free working for most people anyway. You might as well try it. You know, and I have. An example of my own that I wish I'd done a paid app on. And my CEO wishes I'd done a paid app on, you know. The guy writing the checks. So thank you. I enjoyed this.